Is a global war coming? Of course. <laughs> There's never been a century that didn't have a global war. In the 20th century, you know about uh, 19th century is the Napoleonic Wars. 18th century was uh, the Seven Years' War. We can go back and back and back and back. But if you don't think there's a global war coming, then you're saying that the 21st century is going to be the first century in which there isn't a global war. And I will bet against you any amount you want. In fact, global war, all war is sitting with you right now. It's sitting in your pocket. I present to you the iPhone. You've seen this. It carries such superb tools on it as YouTube and Tinder and all the essentials. <laughs> and you guys are so cool that you know that this represents the future and makes you completely different because, well, you're cool. <laughs> Let's talk about it. The foundation of this phone is a microchip. The microchip was developed to guide US intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, against Soviet targets. It had to have a small computer in it. It had to be very light. It had to be very accurate. And the microchip was the solution. And all of the weapons that we used during the Cold War to threaten the annihilation of humanity was built on the microchip. And you now use it today because it's cool. <laughs> but that's what it is. Take a look at the other thing. You have a camera in your phone, the digital camera. That was developed by the US National Reconnaissance Office for spy satellites. Problem we had was that if you took regular pictures with film, how do you get them to Earth? <laughs> so you had to have a way to take pictures of targets of various sorts that didn't require you to drop a, a Kodak film pack down to the earth, because that's what they did at the beginning. And they had to develop some sort of way to take pictures that could get back to earth fast, just the way you send selfies to your mother or something. And that was the digital camera. It was driven by something called the CCD, which I remember the name once, but I can't remember what it's about. And what it did was it took digital pictures that could be beamed back to Earth to target people. Your innocent little camera had its birth in spy satellites. There's GPS. You love it, you walk around the street looking at it instead of the traffic, you get killed. It's, it's a cool device. GPS was invented by the United States Air Force, it was called NAFSTAR, to guide cruise missiles to their targets and to our army units precision in their land navigation. In other words, it was invented to let soldiers know where they were, okay? And it's the most dangerous thing you have in your device because if you don't get hit by a car, you're gonna crash yours while you're staring at it. So it has a violent nature built in. Now, all of this is designed to get to the place where all humanity lives, which is the internet. The internet was developed by the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency to move classified data from one secret lab to the other. So something in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the labs there, we moved to Los Alamos, 
and that would be moved to Brookhaven National Laboratories. And what were they doing in these laboratories? Doing research on nuclear wars, <laughs> because that was the big story then. It was developed with only one thing in mind, to make research more efficient. And when you get on the internet, all the protocols you get and all the cool stuff to get you around were developed by American scientists who were deeply involved in the Cold War. Now, you then have the cell phone, which most of you don't use anymore because you irritate me by sending me text messages instead of picking up the phone. Okay. The cell phone was first deployed in 1985 by the United States Army and was used for the first time in Operation Desert War. And it was entirely invented to facilitate military communication. Bottom line is, there is nothing in this phone, or if you're a religious fanatic in the Android, <laughs> there was nothing in this that was not created for war. So you think about war as a distant thing. You think about war as something that doesn't really have to do with you. And then you pick up this phone, and every bit of it, is drenched in war, in fear of war, and everything else. Now, the Americans are peculiar. In the United States government, they're not allowed to have patents. Basic rule is, if the US government invented it, and it's not secret, it's yours for the taking. It's an odd rule, but it works for us. It means that everything we do in preparing for wars, designing aircraft, everything else, ultimately comes down to being available. So Steve Jobs, who is so cool, invented nothing. <laughs> he took other people's inventions from the government, put them together, and the only thing he invented was marketing. And that, that, was, that was pretty cool. Bill Gates invented nothing. <laughs> MS-DOS was a program he bought from someone that had originally been developed for the Air Force. Zuckerberg invented even less. Your whole generation lives in a fantasy of creativity. The basic tools that guide your life, that permeate you, were developed by warriors or scientists of warriors. It got to you, and a bunch of really smart marketing guys put them together and convince you they were geniuses. The real geniuses made $50,000 a year and retired poor. The marketing guys, they made the money. The reason I'm starting with this is to make it clear to you how intimately your life is involved with war. Leon Trotsky, the famous communist that we all dislike, used to say, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. <laughs> and what he meant by that was the fantasy that you can decide to avoid wars. Wars are among the most ubiquitous things in human life. Wars are constant. They're going on now. They will go on for a long time. People don't like wars. It doesn't matter what you like. And one of the most important things this generation must grasp is that history doesn't give a damn what you like or don't like. You may be a millennial, but you bleed from a bullet just the same as anybody else. 
Your life is built on the things that came out of World War II. What came out of World War II? Two things. Multilateralism, the belief that we should all belong to the European Union, or the United Nations, or the IMF, or the World Bank, and second, the belief in technocracy. World War II was won by the biggest technocrat of all, Dwight Eisenhower. He had never heard a shot fired in anger. <laughs> but he knew how to organize 15 million men to wage war. And out of that came a culture of experts. The belief that experts can guide our society and make it effective and healthy. Okay? And so we surround ourselves with people who know, who are experts. Okay? And in 2008, all of these experts proved, well, they're not quite that experts. But this also led to the love of technology because World War II was won by technology, by radar, by radios, by B-29 bombers, by nuclear weapons. And we believed, Americans and Europeans alike, in the sanctity of technology. But not only that, we decided to make it a virgin again. Very hard thing to do. How do you make it a virgin again? All of these technologies came out of global war. We will pretend that it's no longer connected to it. We'll pretend that war has nothing to do with us. And the point I'm making to you is that you live every day with the product of war. That every part of your life is bound up with this. And the only reason you don't think of it is you don't know that. And you think that if you don't know that, it won't be true. Well, it is. Will there be more wars? Wars occur when some nations rise and some nations fall. World War II started with the rise of Germany after 1871 and unification the rise of Japan, which suddenly became the great Eastern power, and the most important rise, the rise of the United States. In 1865, we finished the Civil War. 600,000 did. 35 years later, the United States produced half the manufactured goods in the world. In other words, wars don't cripple you. Oddly enough, they can enable you. And this world had to make a place for the United States. And there were the British Empire, there was the French Empire, there were all of these European entities that felt that they had an inherent right to dominate the world. And here came Germany, here came Japan, and above all, here came the United States and remade the world. And if I'd asked people in 1935, do you want a world war? They would have said no. They would have voted that way. It didn't matter what they wanted. It happened. And between World War I and World War II, over 100 million people died. Lives were crushed. And it wasn't any poll that you could take that would count. Today, you have rising and falling powers. The United States remains the dominant power. 25% of the world's economy is under the control of the United States. The United States controls all the oceans of the world. It means we get to invade people and they can't invade us, which is an American I'm definitely in favor of. But no power in the history of the world has ever controlled all of the oceans. 
so that simultaneously we are engaged in a crisis in Korea, we're fighting in the Middle East, and we're deploying forces in Poland, Romania, and so on. We have a very strange president, and it doesn't matter, because presidents come and go, and power stays. However stupid Donald Trump is, the United States remains 25% of the world's economy, the only power able to project force anywhere in the world, for good reasons or bad, the United States remains in control of the sea, dominant in space, and we will even survive Donald Trump. There are powers that are declining. Russia. Russia is Saudi Arabia. Speaking Russian. They depend on oil exports. Oil export prices cannot be controlled by the Russians. At $50 a barrel, they can't run the country. So they will invade Syria for no apparent reason to look good. See, we invaded somebody. Good, now you have Aleppo. Congratulations. What are you going to do with it? China is a declining country. It once grew at 15%. It now claims to grow at 6.5%. But it is a country that is extraordinarily poor. The thin strand of China that we think of as wonderful China isn't part of China. It sells its goods to the United States and Europe. And the Europeans have screwed up, so they're stagnating. They can't buy all those goods. And the Americans will screw up, because we always do eventually. And then we can stop buying their goods. And every one of these people depend not on their own genius, but on the willingness of people to buy their products. Who are the countries that are emerging? Japan. It's actually, it didn't ever went away. It's the third largest power in the world. By far a better navy than China has. China PR notwithstanding. The only people who want the Chinese Navy to be great is the U.S. Navy. Because the Chinese Navy is great, they get more budget. So they pretend that it's really very powerful. Um, Japan is the great East Asian power. Turkey. If anybody is going to settle the Arab world, it's the Turks, because that's the only people who ever did settle them during the Ottoman Empire. And they're back. And there's chaos in Turkey as they try to reconcile secular and religious. But there was chaos in the United States during the Civil War. Chaos sometimes destroys you and sometimes makes you a lot stronger. And in this region, Poland, <laughs> which you laugh, but when I first said Japan, people laughed. And then I said Turkey, and they laughed. You're not laughing. Don't laugh about Poland. Why? Russia is in decline. Germany exports 50% of its GDP. Half of its economy depends on its customers buying. And right now, its biggest customer is the United States. And we have a crazy president who doesn't like Merkel. And he's capable of anything. When you're as big as the United States, you can make stupid moves and get away with it. With all of this rising and falling, you think there won't be war? Well, the world is filled with war right now. You may disapprove of it. There may be a poll that says it should stop, but it won't. Merkel, by the way, said after being insulted by Trump, well, we've had enough. We're going to defend ourselves. Thank God, finally. <laughs> Why she thought the United States would be offended at the thought of not having to defend Germany is not clear. But how does Germany, exporting 50% of its GDP, survive? 10% loss in exports is a 5% loss in GDP, which, to put it in technical terms, means they're screwed. So what you have here is 
A declining power, Russia. A declining power, Germany. And a country in the middle that's not doing too bad, Poland. And that's how you figure who's going to be there. Now, is Russia going to go quietly into that good night? I think not. Is Germany going to say, oh, well, you know, we'll be unemployed again 30%? No, that's not Germany style. Is Hungary going to be once more, as in all of its history, caught in a great conflict that it has no control over? Yeah, you're only 10 million people and nobody cares about you. <laughs> Is Hungary going to wind up on the wrong side of the war? We've had a perfect record so far. <laughs> <laughs> and this is your lies. Will you live your life out till the end of the century, as many of you might, without war, without death, without suffering? You're living in a fantasy world. That's not how the human condition works. Before World War I, everybody thought Europe could not have a war because of interdependence. The Germans and the French traded so much with each other. A man called Norman Angell wrote a book saying the great illusion that there could be a war. He was a very smart guy. He was dead wrong. I wish he'd been like 21 in the trenches, dead, dead wrong, but he didn't get to go. The warning that I have to you is that war lurks in your life everywhere. <laughs> the output of the war. And you can pretend this is an innocent, harmless tool. But every piece of it was designed to kill or to help killing. It's just true. It also means that you're going to have to face the fact that the odds are since it's been 70 years since the last systemic war, that's not going to be another 70 years before the next one. Could happen. But again, I'll bet you it won't. Most of you, you'll excuse me, I'm old and cranky. And most of you are self-absorbed and believe that the life that you lead is up to you. Your grandparents may have thought the same thing. It wasn't. Their lives were shaped by events. You think you shape your lives. You think that when you buy an iPhone, you are in control of your life. This is a Cold War weapon combined, and you use it every day, and you don't know it. You don't care about it. And the problem, not of your generation, but of my generation, the boomers, and of every generation, is we think we're different. No, you're not. You're just kids, and you fantasize. Then you grow up, and something completely out of control happens to you and reshapes your life. It would be better if you were prepared for it, if you were aware of it, if you understood the strange statements that are made by leaders actually could not just change your life, but end it. You would be able to confront this much better because what will happen is when it starts, and it will somehow, some way, you will be stunned. You will say it doesn't have anything to do with you. You will say, I didn't want it. I'm a millennial. I get to choose. I'm a boomer. I didn't get to choose. <laughs> My father grew up in Hungary in the 1920s and 30s, and he didn't decide <laughs> on World War II. It is important to understand how deeply intertwined your life is with war of the past and how war can come and visit you, regardless of whether you want it. The confidence of youth is dangerous. It is dangerous because it lives in an illusion of powerfulness, of making decisions, and of determining your future. Most of us, all of us, are caught in webs 
we never expected to be there. And the best you can do is anticipate them. And the reason you won't is you prefer the illusion of power. And it's not there. I hope I've not upset you too much. You don't want to throw anything to me. But it basically means life sucks, <laughs> and then you die. <laughs> OK, I'm done. We're going to go have you sit. Just take a seat there. Yeah. I sit here. <coughs> just sit here. So uh, your, your 10 minute <laughs> that, that is possibly the most perfect music for George's presentation. Uh, you're, you're, you're 10 million people, nobody cares about you, but Brain Bar Budapest cares about you, and we want to hear from you. So this is your chance to ask some questions. questions. Okay. So George, you, you have a unique uh, vision of the world. Um, do you well, have to why do you say it's unique? I, I just think there's... You guys haven't heard it. It was, it's interesting. You know, you're asking the question of war. Huh? What is it good for? Well, it seems to be good for iPhone innovation. And to a degree, is war good for innovation? Yeah. You got an iPhone. Do you like it? <laughs> Our next question. <laughs> Take a seat. Please turn around. Face turn. the I have to turn guest. around? It's yeah, not, you turn automatic. every time. You're going to be spinning I one see. way from the other. I want an automated chair. We, I, we didn't get that far. <laughs> I don't know what battle invents. Uh, maybe in a tank somewhere, there's a nice little automated chair. OK. <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and my question is that uh, if a global war is coming, then how do you see the role of uh, multinational organizations in it, especially NATO, um, and uh, considering uh, President Donald Trump's uh, stance on it, and even your uh, editorial about uh, NATO's uh, obsoleteness? What is NATO? It is a military organization. You can't have a military organization without a military. This is, we've studied this very carefully. Military organization has militaries in them. The issue here is not whether the United States will leave NATO. It's whether Europe will join. Because right now, from the American point of view, the European national strategy is to condemn the Americans for being reckless and demand that they come. OK, that's fine. We'll come. But who are we fighting? So we've had a war for 15 years in the Middle East. Wise, unwise, our people are dying. NATO is nothing to that. So the question. You can ask him why he pressed the button <laughs> there, OK? Yes. I, I have to ask, please. George, are we already at war? So well, we've, sure. seen, we've seen the sort of warfare's fought on the battlefield, but are we seeing lawfare or perhaps even news fare? Is the manipulation of our news by other countries potentially an act of war? An oh, act of war is when I put a bullet in your head. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> this is the act of war, and you have to understand, <laughs> the world is filled with violence. Just okay. not in Budapest yet. <laughs> we have a new question. Thank you for your insightful thoughts. Uh, if there is a third world war, then what will be the tools that it will be fought with? Nuclear well, weapons or cyber? I don't know, but they'll be designed to kill people. <laughs> sure. So, what about, <laughs> what about cyber war, George? Uh, to her question, do you think the war will be fought not on the battlefield, but on the web? What about cyber war? I don't know what cyber war is. <laughs> My next question. Now that I was standing on right, I, I actually realized that I, I read about your books on what Wikipedia. Well, I just realized I, I read about your books on Wikipedia, and they seemed very interesting. But what I wanted to ask is, who are your favorite philosophers? Hegel. Cool. <laughs> Why Hegel? Hegel designs history showing its predictability, showing its agonies, mm -hmm showing its moral dimension. He addresses the reality of human life. And he deals with generations rather indifferently. There's a generation to deal with. The millennial generation. What's the best strategy to survive a global war? Arm yourself. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> With what? <laughs> ah, that becomes an interesting discussion. We should have a discussion of what you want to arm yourself with. Who's your enemy? Uh, here, he's going to ask a question. Right. Uh, <laughs> so you in particular were pretty good at uh, escaping war, and I don't think that you're seriously, con I mean, you're seriously concerned, but you're probably be pretty good at avoiding, you know, bombs falling on your head and people shooting you. Yes, I'm alive. Isn't that right? Yeah. My uh, son, my daughter. Isn't that a good enough skill to have? Shouldn't we just, you know, all learn how to run away from war? Yes, but if you're all running away from fine. war, yeah. they can it's find it's you. Insane. I have not escaped war. In my Your father family. did? My father did, my children. My daughter was an intelligence officer in Iraq, and she fought for several years in Iraq. My son is in the Air Force, inventing some of these things. He, he does that. In the United States, being in the military is not an uncommon thing. It is not something that poor people do. It, it, it's, it's a life. And my family's life from my father's survival was bound up with it. But it was not only, and the heart of his, it wasn't smart, he was lucky. So if you want to run away from it, you can't outrun a bullet. Some of you will survive, some of you won't. Everybody is not wiped out. But in terms of my life, it begins in the wake of World War II, passes through the struggle against the Soviet Union, for my children passes into the Islamist wars. Um, Europe has had a wonderful time having, in the first half of the 20th century, killed 20% of its population. It declared, well, thank God that's over. But is it? Thank you. And um, our final question? Yes, final question here. Where do you predict the next major civil war? And if your reply is going to be really quick, then two civil wars, majors. And is it possible in a major Western country? I don't see any possibility in a major Western country. But in 1850, nobody would have predicted the civil war in the United States. Civil wars are very hard to predict because they are driven by issues not only of interest, but of passion and so on. So, I mean, it is said that there's a chance of another civil war in the Balkans, and that if such a civil war in the Balkans happened, it might spread to include other countries in Central Europe. I don't know. I do know there's a massive civil war going on in the Islamic world, and I do know that Europeans are dying from it, not many. So I'm sure that in a room like this filled with people, no one would think of planting a bomb. But it's, other than that, uh, the point is small civil wars go on everywhere. Large civil wars stay a long time. It'll be Do you think we'll ever see war from corporation to corporation, between corporations, not between nation states? Corporations are read by leaders who have two goals to stay alive and make money. It is possible to make money without killing people, or more important, without being killed yourself. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. Uh, what if the new global war won't be fought against a country, but against terrorism, and there are no, not always clear battlefields uh, on terrorism? Yeah, I mean, that is always a huge problem, which is that if you have a subnational group, it's a, it's a problem. So, in 1848, in Europe, there was massive uprisings. I think you learned of them in school, no? Maybe not. <laughs> For sure. Uh, the 1848 risings were subnational. They, they were not states. The best way to deal with one is to kill them all. And this is what happened in 1848, the mass slaughter. The United States is trying not to kill everyone. In the end, it may wind up doing it unintentionally. This is the United States. Did you ever see South Park Team America? Yeah. Remember how accidentally we blew up the Eiffel Tower? We didn't mean it. We were just there. That's the United States. So how do you deal with these wars? Not well, not permanently, but with the only thing that war has, which is violence. Thank you. 
Wow. Joking aside, in all seriousness, George, that was an incredible presentation. Yes. And please join me in thanking uh, George for his insights. Thank you.